Street photography is probably one of the easiest types of photography to get started in and one of the most difficult types of photography to do well. And in this video, I'm gonna give you 10 tips that helped me to improve my street photography and hopefully can help you too. What's up folks, my name's Liam. I'm a street photographer based in Colorado. If you're looking for more street photography based videos, hit that subscribe button. I make new videos every week. There's lots of different street photography tips out there. These are the 10 that I have found most useful in my own personal growth. And throughout the video, I'll also throw up on the screen some pictures that I've took that sort of relate to each of the points. And also just so that you're not staring at my face the entire time. One of the biggest mistakes I used to make was thinking that I had to take two or three different lenses out with me, or even sometimes a tripod, because maybe I would want to use the tripod or those other lenses to get a specific type of shot. Because if I saw something that was further away and I didn't have the right thing for it, I would kick myself forevermore for not having the right gear to get that shot. And as time went on, I realized that having more gear with me only gave me the illusion that I was prepared for any kind of shot. This wasn't landscape photography, it wasn't a professional shoot. And I found myself constantly second guessing if I needed to switch lenses because something further away showed up when I, had a, when I had a wider lens on or I had a longer lens on and something happened right in front of us and I was constantly, oh, I wish I should switch, I should do this. And the gear became the overwhelming thing that I cared about when I carried a lot of it. At some point I decided that I was just going to leave the house with one camera and one lens so I didn't have to carry all this extra stuff. And it wasn't long before I started to realise that this gave me more freedom. I started to feel free to concentrate on what was happening right in front of me instead of what would be the right lens for this situation. And especially when I stuck to one prime lens, I got to know that focal length really well. You get in it almost like a state of flow with it. and. And you can sort of judge how far you need to be from something and what else is going to be in the frame when, when you know that focal length really well. And that is when things start to really improve. The camera that you currently have might be old, it might be cheap, it might not be the choice of many street photographers out there. But if you know how to use it, you know it well, it will not stop you from making successful images. Practice with it a lot, develop that muscle memory of being able to change the settings without really having to look at it. You know where the buttons are. You can start to adjust it even as you're lifting it up to your eye. I've played with this camera for so long that I always know when I'm at f8, when I'm at 5.6, f2 is easy to get to because it stops there, but I can always put it back. That's at five points, that's actually at five. Close enough, and then eight. That's at f8, it's probably not gonna focus. But without looking, I can always tell where f8 is. And I know that if I'm on auto, I can do one, two, three clicks, and I'm on one one thousandth of a second, four clicks, it's a five hundredth. And then four clicks back to auto. So knowing the camera well and being able to manipulate it without really having to pay attention and look where the buttons are and think about it will really help you. There's a lot of different approaches and styles to street photography and it can make your head spin at first. For sure, I was really confused for quite a long time about how I would shoot things and what style I wanted to take. So I recommend starting small and then adding things in from there. For example, if you live in a place that's quite sunny and you get a lot of nice long shadows and strong harsh light and contrast, then start with light and shadow type photos. There's plenty of inspiration of that on Instagram. Then start to move on to things, look at windows, reflections, go out in the rain, shoot puddles, as cliche as it sounds, shoot umbrellas, subframe things, and just gradually add these little things until you start to feel comfortable in lots of different situations and you can sort of switch between things and start to see a scene for what it might be able to produce. I used to actually carry a notepad with me so that if I came out and I felt a bit lost, sometimes I was overwhelmed, I could take my notepad out, read some ideas and look around me to see if I could see any of those things and it would just help me to sort of get moving again and shoot some, just get shooting something. This kind of carries on from the last tip but gestures sort of deserve their own place I think and I think gestures might be the key 
to great street photography. Most of the great photos from pioneers of street photography seem to have some kind of gesture in them. And it can be something as simple as a hand pointing at something or reaching out for something, uh, someone's hair blowing in the wind, a, an umbrella that's turned inside out. It doesn't even have to be human. It can be a flag, some fabric that's blown around in the wind, maybe some smoke or some steam, birds flying around or an animal doing something. You don't need it in every shot. It can be difficult to find sometimes or to time properly. But when you do get it, it can make all the difference to your pictures and turn what might be an average picture into an amazing picture. I'm stealing this tip from Matt Stewart. I saw it in a YouTube video that he was in. So it's basically there's three main techniques to street photography. The first one is fish. This is where you stand in one spot, maybe on a street corner and find a frame and wait for something to come into that frame. You might even just sort of hover around that street corner and wait for something to come to you that's interesting and then you can take photos of that. But you're staying in one place and waiting for it to come to you. The second one is follow. So if you see an interesting person or event happening and you just sort of follow along with it. Uh, the only real example I've got of this is protests where I've attended a protest and I've basically been following along and looking for the action. And by following, hopefully this interesting person that you're following will come upon a more interesting scene or something else will happen and that will become the photo. And the last F rhymes with duck. And that's when you come across something and it's happening right now. You don't have any time to think about your framing or try different angles. You just have to take the picture and hope that you got it right. This tip I don't hear very often. I learned it in a video with Adam Morelli and it's to try and find good figure to ground. And basically what figure to ground is, if you have a dark figure, you want a lighter background than what that figure is. And if you have a light figure, you want a darker background. And it doesn't always have to be like silhouettes. It just has to be contrast basically between the, the figure and the ground. So sometimes you might start off with light on this side of someone and they're in shadow here and the light is then hitting here and there's shadow over here. So you have figure to ground here and figure to ground here, but it's opposite. So as long as you have that sort of separation, then your, your attention will still be drawn to your subject because your subject will be clearly defined. I'm sure I'm butchering it. He explains it far better than me. And if I can find the video that it was in, I'll link it down below. Becoming a good technician is great, but getting too caught up in it can ruin your chances at getting great street photos. It's not landscape photography. It's not studio photography. There's not always time to set everything up perfectly and wait for that shot or make that shot happen. Most of the time, you don't really know what's coming and you just have to shoot. And if your camera's not set up perfectly for it, you have to try and adjust or focus while you're shooting. And what you end up with sometimes is imperfect photos that have motion blur or they're out of focus or they're maybe not framed quite perfectly or they've got crooked horizons and that's okay. Oh, f it got bright. If the resulting photo is imperfect, at least you shot it. And with street photography, sometimes that imperfection actually makes the picture better. Robert Frank is regarded as one of the greatest photographers of all time, and he regularly embraced imperfection in his pictures. Whether it was purposeful or not, it still turned out amazing. One of the biggest growth mechanisms for me was that I decided to carry my camera every day, wherever I could, even when I thought I wasn't gonna get any good pictures or the place I was in was not interesting. And if you do that and you don't get any pictures that you like for a few weeks, maybe even a few months, you have to be determined and keep doing it. Because as long as you carry your camera and you pay attention and you look at things and you watch the light and you, and you see how the places that you go and the scenes change with the seasons and with the light, eventually you will get a good photo. It'll feel like pure luck. You're not even sure at the time if it's actually gonna be a good photo until you get home and see it on the computer screen. But the more you do it, the more you carry your camera and the more you shoot, the luckier that you're gonna, that you're gonna be. The one thing that was a barrier for me to carry my camera every day was that I had full frame cameras and they were just kind of big and they weren't, they were, 
they're not easy just to throw on and carry when you're going walking the dog or going to the store. So that was one of the reasons why I bought Fujifilm cameras because they're small, I can take them anywhere, throw them over my shoulder and barely even notice that they're there. And that allowed me to remove that barrier and carry my camera every day. Learn to shoot manual, but don't feel like you need to use it if you don't want to. Shooting in manual doesn't make you a proper street photographer and shooting auto doesn't mean you're not a proper street photographer either. Most of the time I'm using auto ISO. I just set my aperture to f8 and if it's a bright enough day, I'll leave my shutter on auto as well. And for me, that frees up some headspace so I can think about my camera a little bit less. But when I come across a situation where I need to dial those settings in, I can do it easily. I would just rather not do it and think more about what's happening in front of me. However, if you learn to shoot manual and prefer it that way, then keep shooting manual. Then like whatever works for you is always going to be the best way to do things. Image quality is great to have, but nobody became a better street photographer by just having better image quality in their camera. Whenever new gear comes out, there's always this feeling that the older generations of cameras no longer cut it or make your pictures somehow worse. Sure, image quality is beneficial to have, and generally with more capable cameras comes better image quality, but that's really not a requirement to make a better street photo or to make you a better photographer. In a professional setting, it's completely valid because image quality becomes of higher value at that point, but it's just not as important on the street. Great street photographers have made amazing pictures on phones, on point and shoots, on any type of camera there is. Even if the image quality is terrible, a great street photographer will still be able to make great images with low quality image quality. So avoid that temptation to invest in the newest 40 megapixel camera because that might not be the best camera for the job that you're trying to do. You'd be far better placed to just have a camera that works well for how you like to shoot, that feels good in your hand and you can work all the controls well. Or you might find that the previous cheaper model from that new camera is a good enough upgrade for what you need and will do everything that you need it to do. Especially nowadays when cameras are far more capable than most of us need them to be. And look, I understand the hypocrisy that I've just bought a Fuji X100V, which is the newest of its generation, and I probably could have done, I could have done the same work with the X100F. I justified this to myself because this has weather sealing, if I put a filter on the front, and I actually kind of like the flip up screen. I got used to that on the X-T2. I didn't really need it. I would have been fine with the X100F, but, I guess that consumerism side of it got the better of me and I bought the newest model. And I do plan to have this camera out in the rain, out in the desert and dusty environments and generally in places where weather might get in a camera that's not weather sealed. And it's pretty much the closest to the exact right tool that I want. I could have bought an EOS R5 or whatever the new full frame DSLR things are got better image quality, got full frame sensor, faster shooting, better autofocus, all that stuff. But I don't really need or want any of that stuff. I, I this is, this will do the job. Hopefully you understand where I'm coming from there. I'm gonna stop rambling and just, it's, it's, it's time to move on from that point. Drop me a comment down below if there's any tips that I missed out or that you use that I didn't mention here. Hit that like button if you enjoyed this video. Uh, subscribe if you haven't already. And thank you very much for watching. I'll uh, I'll see you in the next video. Cheers. Cheers.